Hello everyone and welcome to the 2020 PDB Art Exhibition opening. Firstly, I'd just like to remind you that this event is being recorded and we will make the recording available after today. So firstly, to introduce myself, I'm David Armstrong. I work for the Protein Data Bank in Europe as the Outreach and Training Coordinator. And I'll be helping guide you through today's opening event, along with my colleague, Deepti Gupta, um, who you'll see now, and Hello, she everyone. manages the PDB Art Project. So firstly, I just want to guide you through uh, what will be happening as part of this exhibition opening. So to begin, we'll have a welcome from Samir Valanka, who is the team leader for the PDBE. Once we've heard from Samir, we'll then have an introductory tour of the virtual PDB art exhibition. And this will give you an, the possibility to see some of the artworks involved in the exhibition and an idea of some of the themes that have been explored by the students involved in the project. Next, I'm delighted that we've got two speakers with us today. Um, firstly, we have Dr. Laurie Passmore, who is a group leader at the MRC Laboratory of Molecular Biology. And her and her team actually are involved in determining the structures and the shapes of proteins, which then go into the PDB archive and then become inspirations for the artworks that are part of this exhibition. Our second speaker is Melissa Pierce Murray. She is an artist who uses various types of materials to create sculptures and is also involved in some science art outreach projects, which look at materials at the nanoscale. So we're delighted to have these two speakers with us, but we also have some words from the students who were involved in the project in the last year, telling us a bit about what they found out through the project and what they've really found interesting. Now, following that video, we're going to have a question and answer session to give you the option to ask questions to the speakers. And throughout this meeting, you have an option for Q&A at the bottom of the window. And this will allow you to uh, present your questions um, any time during the event, and we'll collate those at the end and ask those to the speakers. Okay, so that's our, um, that's our event. So firstly, I would like to hand over to Samir, um, who will welcome you and open the exhibition. Uh, so thank you, David. Um, thank you all again for uh, joining this open evening where we are celebrating the amazing artwork. Um, and I also want to uh, welcome Laurie and, and Melissa. So we started this project five years ago um, and the idea was to explore uh, a, a activity, art and science activity, uh, to make science um, understandable, engaging and enjoyable. Uh, but we also wanted to highlight the interdisciplinary nature of scientific work and the importance of art in scientific communication. And I feel that uh, with the help of uh, wonderful teachers that we have um, in this project, we are realizing that goal. Uh, each year I'm uh, inspired to see some very challenging and topical issues um, that are very elegantly explored through art. It's exciting to also see that the art and science teachers are now exploring common lesson plans. So that's, that's been fantastic. Um, and finally, all, all this is possible because um, as I said, the wonderful teachers, uh, students, and let's not forget all the supporting parents. Uh, so thank you all again. Um, I also want to welcome our Australian colleague, Dr. Anisha Patel, uh, who is working with teachers and students in Melbourne, uh, taking this project international for the first time. Um, so very big thank you to her. Uh, and a very big thank you to David, our uh, training and public engagement lead, uh, and Deepti who coordinates the art project, uh, and Roshin um, who, who has helped and worked hard um, uh, for bringing this virtual exhibition 
uh, in these very difficult times. Um, so thank you also to art societies uh, and everyone else who has supported this project over the last five years. Um, so thank you again for joining us uh, and enjoy the evening. Thank you. Great, thank you, Samir. Uh, so the next part of the event, we want to show you a video that gives you a tour of the virtual exhibition allows you to get an idea of some of the pieces that are involved in the exhibit, and also some of the themes explored by the students as part of those artworks. So uh, we'll now share that video with you. The PDB Art Project is an outreach initiative involving eight schools, two art societies, and the Protein Data Bank in Europe. We work together to inspire school students from 13 to 17 years old to learn about the 3D molecular structures in the PDB and use these to inspire the creation of artworks as part of their art curriculum. Students learn to explore and research their protein of interest to create artworks accompanied by scientific descriptions which are showcased in this exhibition. This tour will introduce you to some of these artworks created in this year's project and discuss some of the themes covered by these pieces. Students from the lower sixth form at Stephen Peirce Foundation each picked their own topic to research, relating to protein structures. Here, Olivia Jinx looked into the shapes of proteins to study their secondary and tertiary structure and found inspiration in keratin. This is a fibrous structural protein found in many biological structures, including hair and nails. Olivia uses her portrait to represent the structures of keratin as part of her hair. Megan Grenfell found inspiration for her textiles artwork, Catalyst for Change, from the enzyme helicase that she was studying as part of her biology lessons. The 3D structure enabled her to visualize the unwinding event of the DNA double helix that is required for several biological processes, including DNA replication, transcription, and translation. Megan also draws parallels between this process and our own emotional unraveling in the face of change and how it reflects our personal unwinding or struggle in the face of growth and change. Students from Impington College, aged 13 to 14, explored a number of proteins as part of the PDB art project. The final pieces created by the students are 3D sculptures using mixed media, including wire, modern rock, fancy film and tissue paper. Though the artworks are varied in style and based on different proteins, students created shapes inspired by common protein structure themes such as alpha helices and viral capsids. This piece by Lilu Brock is a sculpture of a bacteriophage a type of virus that infects and kills bacteria. In fact, the word bacteriophage literally means bacteria eater. Just like other viruses, bacteriophages are composed of a DNA or RNA genome surrounded by a protein coat, with a long tail tube through which the DNA or RNA is injected into the host cell. Lilu has taken the iconic shape of the bacteriophage and personified it by adding a top hat and a monocle. In this artwork, the structure of haemoglobin has been created using Lego bricks by David Rickards, a Year 10 student from Thomas Gainsborough School. The choice of Lego provides a good analogy for the construction of protein structures. Just as Lego pieces are assembled to construct a meaningful object, proteins' amino acid building blocks are ordered and arranged in a specific way to determine the protein structure. 
David says that these Lego bricks also represent the coming together and building of our knowledge of these tiny yet significant structures. This year saw the first involvement of an international school in the project, with Viewbank College from Melbourne, Australia providing artworks for the exhibition. This was possible thanks to collaboration with Dr Anisha Patel, a structural biologist at the Walter and Eliza Hall Institute of Medical Research, who uses cutting-edge imaging technologies to capture the inner beauty of molecules that make up life at a nanoscale. Anisha introduced Year 11 students from Viewback College to protein structures and the PDB, inspiring them to create the unique and varied artworks seen here. This artwork by Charlotte Agnew from Viewbank College focuses on serotonin receptors and their relationship with mental health. Serotonin in the brain is thought to regulate anxiety, happiness and mood with low levels of serotonin associated with depression. Charlotte's artwork uses bold colours with the warm reds representing happiness while the cooler blues represent depression. The artwork also incorporates protein alpha helices to highlight the importance of serotonin receptors in modulating these moods. This artwork, made entirely from metal wire, was created by 14-year-old Rosie Bray from Thomas Gainsborough School. Rosie looked at a protein from the horse spot fly and was fascinated with the symmetry and intricacy of both the protein structure and the wings of the fly. Symmetry in biology is observed in a variety of organisms, including plants, animals, viruses and bacteria, and is commonly observed in the tiny structures of proteins. She uses the empty space in the piece to represent how she would imagine the human body without proteins, describing it as a dull, hollow, lifeless carcass, highlighting the importance of proteins in life. At the Perth School in Cambridge, teachers from both the Arts and Science departments collaborated together on the PDB Art Project last year. As part of their science curriculum, Year 9 students learnt about the biology and structures of three proteins haemoglobin, keratin and salivary amylase. The students use this knowledge and their exploration of the PDB archive in creation of these fantastic ceramic artworks in their art lessons. The sculptures incorporate various structures from the biology of these proteins, including red blood cells, long keratin fibres and both protein and DNA helices. Year 12 student Anna from the Lee School was inspired by the structural proteins that provide support in our bodies, including collagen. Collagen is the most abundant structural protein in our bones, tendons, ligaments and skin. Anna has taken images of the chemical structure of collagen, as well as the bones of the human rib cage, and used them to create this screen print. The rib and collagen structure are both in white mirroring the white bones of the human body and allowing the images to stand out against the darker coloured background. This artwork from Year 12 Lee's student Esther Robson is based on her research into photosensitive epilepsy. Although not a common condition, it still infiltrates the lives of people with the condition who can experience seizures triggered by flashing or flickering lights. This artwork incorporates the glutamate receptor protein involved in the transfer of neurological signals and a target for anti-epileptic drugs which may suppress this response. In this piece, Esther represents the light bulb filament as a 3D image of the glutamate receptor protein, highlighting its significance in fighting seizures triggered by light.
That concludes our tour of the 2020 PDB Art Exhibition. We hope that this has given you an insight into the types of artwork created as part of the project. Each artwork in the virtual exhibition has an associated description, so please browse these at your leisure to find even more of these wonderful artistic interpretations of science and the PDB. If you would like any further information about the project, then please visit our website at pdbe.org slash art. Hello everyone. I hope you enjoyed the video. We would now like to invite Dr. Laurie Passmore from MRC LMB in Cambridge. As you all know, LMB is one of the world's leading research institutes, also referred to as the Nobel Factory, with 12 Nobel Prizes awarded to the LMB scientists for their work. And it is our great, great pleasure to have Laurie with us today. And she is one of the leading structural biologists who uses cutting edge technologies to study structure and function of biologically important molecules, especially proteins, which are the molecular machines of the cell. So let's hear it out from Laurie about her experience and life as a scientist. Over to you, Laurie. Thank you very much, Deepti. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here. And as Deepti said, I'm a research scientist. And over the next 10 minutes, I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself, our work, and what it's like to be a research scientist. I will also highlight some examples of how we use art and science. So I'm originally from Canada, and I moved to the UK after university to study for my PhD in London. PhDs in science take around three or four years, and during this time, you learn how to independently perform research. I studied science because I think biology is fascinating. There's so much that we don't understand. And it's so exciting to do research where I'm sometimes the first person to ever see a protein or discover a new process. So after my PhD, I did four years of postdoctoral research, and I now lead a lab at the MRC Laboratory of Molecular Biology in Cambridge. There are currently 11 PhD students and postdoc scientists working in my group, and they come from all over the world. Each of them stays in my lab for around four or five years, and we also collaborate with many other groups around the world, so science really is global. Everyone in my lab has their own projects, but they really work together as a team to investigate exciting new areas of biology. My group is one of 14 groups working in the structural studies division here, where our aim is to see proteins and to make detailed pictures or movies to see how they work. In total, there are four divisions in LMB and over 800 people work in the building. So in my lab, we study gene expression. And you know that genes are encoded in DNA. A temporary copy of genes is made into RNA, which can then be translated into proteins. And proteins are really the motors, the building blocks, and the molecular machines in our cells. So the main questions that we want to address in my lab are, how is damaged DNA repaired? And how is RNA controlled to regulate gene expression? Now, all of these processes are controlled by proteins. So in the lab, we design experiments to tell us how these proteins work. This includes growing cells, purifying proteins, doing assays, using microscopes, and analyzing data using sophisticated computer programs. Now, as I already mentioned, a major aim of our work is to visualize proteins and specifically those that control DNA repair and RNA so that we can understand how they work. So to visualize them, we use cryo-electron microscopy or cryo-EM. Now, the proteins that we look at are on average 20 nanometers in size, or in other words, they're 10,000 times smaller than the diameter of human hair. So another way to, uh, to think about this is that the difference in the size of a human compared to that of the size of the sun is about the same as the difference in the size of a protein compared to a human. 
So to visualize these very tiny proteins, we uh, uh, image them with microscopes that use a beam of electrons, enabling us to image them at 100,000 times magnification. So this is a photo of a cryo-electron microscope in the LMB. And as you can see, these machines take up an entire room. They cost millions of pounds and they're used 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And so we really need to plan in advance to book time on the microscope. Now, when we image our proteins using these electron microscopes, it results in two dimensional images such as this. Now, each of these um, objects on the picture is an individual protein molecule. And I have to say, I still find it amazing that we can see these little nano machines with our own eyes. So we combine these two dimensional images computationally to make three dimensional structures. And this works in much the same way that a CT scan uses 2D x-rays to generate a three dimensional representation of the human body. Now these 3D structures have details about the placement of every atom within the protein. So we are able to build atomic models from these, really allowing us to visualize the chemistry of life. And this is really important because it tells us how these proteins work and how they go wrong in disease. In some cases, it allows the design of new drugs or treatments. Now scientists have used models and art to simplify their data and results for a very long time. Um, and this can really allow us to explain our findings to others. But even beyond that, sometimes we build models of proteins really as an integral part of our work. So Watson and Crick famously built models of DNA. And by trying out different ways of fitting the building blocks together, they were able to come up with this iconic double-stranded structure that we all know now. So this is a photo of a reproduction of one of their models, um, and that's here in the LMB. Now, when Watson and Crick published their paper that described the structure of DNA, Francis Crick's wife drew a picture of their model. Now, remember, until this time, no one knew what DNA looked like. So this artistic representation was really important. And in fact, it was the only figure in the paper. Now the granddaughter of Francis and Adil Crick, Kendra Crick, is an artist who has taken inspiration from her grandparents and created a sculpture of double-stranded DNA, which is now uh, located just outside this room in the LMB. This piece is called What Mad Pursuit, and I'll just quote uh, Kendra Crick. It explores the creative possibilities achievable through the fusion of art, science, and imagination in the quest for knowledge. So I'd like to just spend the last few minutes discussing some recent results from my lab. And I mentioned that we want to understand how DNA damage is repaired. And one type of damage is DNA crosslinks. And this is when the two strands of the DNA helix become crosslinked together. And this can occur after exposure to chemicals like chemotherapeutic drugs or alcohol but it also occurs just during normal cellular metabolism when cells make mistakes. So these crosslinks mean that the strands of DNA can't separate. And so we, the DNA can't be replicated and it can't be made into that temporary RNA copy. So it's really critical that these crosslinks are removed and repaired. If they aren't repaired, it leads to human disease called Fanconi anemia. This is a rare but serious disorder that has a wide spectrum of symptoms. And that includes developmental defects, bone marrow failure, and predisposition to cancer. And so my lab has been purifying the proteins that are involved in repairing DNA crosslinks and studying their structures. So here are two of the proteins that we imaged in the electron microscope. And this movie really shows different ways of representing those proteins. So in the proteins are in uh, blue and pink. And what we found out by determining their structures is that these proteins actually form a DNA clamp. So they close around the damaged DNA. And that acts as a signal 
to recruit the enzymes that are needed to cut out the crosslink and put fresh DNA back in its place. So this um, here, the, the movie ends on a cartoon representation of the protein where we see the secondary structure of the protein. And many of the, the art um, in the exhibition uses this secondary structure of cartoon-like representation um, in their pieces. Now we can also look at um, how the protein changes. Here I'm going between um, the protein when it's bound to DNA and when it's not bound to DNA. And what you can see is it really embraces the DNA wrapping right around it, really acting like a clamp. And the green protein on the bottom then acts to kind of hold that clamp in place. Now, these are accurate scientific picture representations of our, of our data, but we also collaborated with um, scientific illustrators. Here, this is from Phosphobiomedical Animation to make other representations that we can use to communicate our findings and understand our data. And so again, this shows in blue and pink the clamp around the yellow DNA. And in this representation, you can really see how the clamp bends the DNA. And we think that may be important in helping to repair it. Um, Phospho also made this movie. This is a different protein that helps to repair the, the crosslinks. And it's flexible in solution. And so the movie shows how it bends and twists. Now, I'm really sorry that you can't be here today. We really enjoyed having some of you here last year, and we wish we could welcome you here again. Here are some LMB scientists, including Terence and, and uh, Manuel from my lab, um, showing an interactive activity that we made on how to determine protein structures. And if you watch out for us in the future, hopefully we'll be back at some Cambridge Science Festivals very soon. So thank you for inviting me today. There's some really amazing art in the exhibition. And I wanted just to end by saying that new knowledge in science often comes through really imaginative and creative new ideas. So there are really lots of ways that artists and scientists are similar and can work together. And I think this exhibition is a really amazing demonstration of that. So I would like to commend the artists on such fantastic work. Thank you. Thank you, Laurie, for such an amazing talk, such an interesting talk, and bringing the art and science together. And uh, I, I really, I'm really thankful that that you, you, you know, you are here uh, to talk, to present this to us. And I'm sure there will be a lot of questions from the audience who would like to ask Laurie. So please uh, post your questions in the, in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen and we will present them um, in, our, in our session later on. So thank you, Laurie, once again for, for um, to, come us, uh, to come here. And uh, I would now like to invite our second speaker for the evening, uh, who is Melissa Murray. Hello, Melissa. And she is a Cambridge-based sculpture and visual artist. In the past, Melissa has facilitated a number of interactions with students, um, with artists and scientists. For instance, she produced a series of art and science film called Nano Vignettes for the Cambridge Science Festival and Royal Society Summer Exhibition. She also did workshop, creative workshop for um, called Drawing on Science with the University of Cambridge Nano Doctoral Training Center. So as Melissa comes from an interdisciplinary background where she studied English literature, physics, and fine arts, it is a great pleasure to have you here. And let's find out more about what you have done and learn as, as a life as a science, as an artist. So over to you, Melissa. Okay, hello, um, thank you very much. Um, yeah, so what is surprising to me is how uh, unlinked art and science are in many people's minds. Um, how from an early age, people tend to divide and focus their abilities and, and specialize in one discipline to the neglect of others. Um, because I believe that we're all naturally scientists and artists. That's what it is to be human. Um, and I think sometimes our natural abilities are uh, sort of educated out of us. And that's why I'm so pleased to be able to talk with you on the occasion of this exhibition. 
what I've seen through your works and heard through your writing is and discussion is how artists and scientists have taken their time to really engage with each other, explaining, asking questions, and through these encounters, exploring new territories um, and seeing their own work through different lenses. I think that this is the strength of working in an interdisciplinary way and across disciplines. It's like climbing a mountain and each altitude you encounter new landscapes and you also turn around and see your own territory from a different perspective. Um, so there are various ways that art and science can interact. And a common one that we've touched upon is, is how uh, scientists use artists to help communicate accurate science to a wider audience. And I'll give you some examples uh, of the Nana vignettes and the drawing and science towards the end of my talk. Um, can I have the first slide, please? Um, we're going to, going to share a screen here. Um, it, but it's important to uh, that art not be regarded just as illustrative. The point is not always to be literal. Because to see and to perceive and to understand, they're not objective activities in any discipline. Rather, it's a process of coming to an understanding and constructing a rigorous model of our current knowledge. And uh, this is another benefit for um, scientists working with artists and artists working with scientists. Um, but artists can be more attuned to the broader currents, which can influence our thinking. So I'd like to show you how I use interdisciplinary thinking in my own work. Um, and as I, uh, you've heard that I am drawing on poetry and physics and, and, and physical dance, so many disciplines. So may I have the next slide, please? Um, so this, um, so I use objects to think. Um, I've de developed a way of using a sculpture kit of pre-fashioned elements, um, for example, steel, plasma cut steel shards, carved shafts of oak, cast metals, plaster boulders, sometimes rope, pebbles, bubble, bubble wrap or dancers and light. I use these to investigate a range of propositions and compositions. And I move through ideas quickly and often using elements to stand in as visual or conceptual markers. And this way of working allows me to try out ideas for permanent works, such as this one that we see here and also prompt further ideas for other, other sculptures, drawings, or prints. And often I'm interested in the boundaries between interior and exterior worlds. So I'll contrast an emotional uh, felt response against uh, intellectual or culturally constructed narratives. So I use the sculpture kit and contemporary approaches to drawing and choreography to make a series of sculptural arrangements entitled Choreographed Drawings. Um, and for me, I just want to mention that there's a relationship between writing and drawing and thinking and figuring things out. And so a work such as this is, is like a sort of rendition of that playful movement and thinking in, in, in a moment and resting in a moment. Can I have the next slide, please? Um, so in 2016, I collaborated with a video artist and dancers to create a piece called Breaking Boundaries. And this was a, a, a sort of a 10 minute performance piece for a series of public science lectures, which involved several Nobel Prize laureates. Um, we layered sound, video, sculptures, and dancers. And we began with the exploration of the body and the senses and extended to interactions with others and with the world around us. The choreography we used was motivated by scientific concepts from the individual lectures of the speakers, such as neuroscience, cloaking technologies, astrophysics, and particle physics. And the visuals included scientific and artistic imagery. And soundscape also included uh, sounds such as the atmospheric sounds from uh, of space captured in Antarctica. Um, and so in my next slide here, if I have the next slide, um, I, so although I make sculptures and objects, I'm also interested to make pieces which are transient or have an element of performance. Um, and the reason I, one of the reasons I work this way is that I want people to approach, rather than a static object, I want them to approach it thinkingly. And so if I have something movement or something that's dynamic or changing or pulls you in, then, then people interact with it in a, in a very much more active way. So this piece, Stasis, was a set of sculptures made in steel and ice. And the work took inspiration from the balance of volcanic and glacial forces in Iceland. 
Ice freezes into crystals. It flows in glaciers and fractures into icebergs and flows. It um, freezes and preserves and melts and unlocks layers of natural and human history. Though iron is a natural element, um, steel is forged in fire. It's a man-made and fabricated substance which has enabled technology and industry and warfare. And in the context of this work, I wanted to use ice as something elemental and ubiquitous, a reflection of the state of the earth, and then and use the steel as a measure of the activities of humans. So the word stasis I'm using here to refer to this tensioned balance between materials and to the inevitable release of power. So in this next slide here, um, I have a piece called Shift. Um, and this was a set of unstable arrangements of hollow clay stones and wooden blades. And I was thinking about China and traces of ancient civilizations um, imprinted on the land. So the hollow clay forms evoke both stones from distant mountains weathered in rivers. Um, so they have a geological history, but also containers made from river clay. Each stone is if marked as if cataloged from an archaeological dig. So they contain human or cultural histories as well. I was thinking of the soil and earth near river beds, both fertile and unstable. The clay here is contrasted with carved wooden blades, which um, referring to stone age ceremonial tools made of polished jade, but I've made them into constructions like that can be uh, structural, uh, well, they make different structures um, like houses uh, or, or bridges. Um, and the wood and clay forms worked with people to arrange them variously in a changing form of a snaking river. So I'm fascinated by the boundaries and the dynamic interactions at places where juxtaposing forces and materials meet. And with these works, I was trying to evoke the relationships between human objects and the environment. Um, so the last slide here, um, because um, I, because of my own background, I've been interested not only in the outcomes of artist science interactions, but also exploring the ways in which they interact. And so I've worked on several projects with the Nano Doctoral Training Center at the University of Cambridge. In one project called Nano Art, I, I had artists visit labs and scientists visit studios to share their working environments. And then the pairs work together to explore questions of perception and scale and self-assembly at the nanoscale and create outcomes from public presentation. A common theme which emerged was how similar or complementary their working processes were, even when the aim of their individual outcomes were different. And more specifically, um, how we use metaphoric language and concepts to imagine and communicate ideas about the structures explored. And uh, as Deepta said, I led a drawing on science series of creativity workshop for scientists. And I would present um, different topics and, uh, and teach um, uh, the scientists um, different artistic methodologies and they'd have an opportunity to, to try these out. And then eventually, as a sort of as an outcome, we had this opportunity to create nano vignettes, which is a series of microfilms of artists using their media to explain cutting edge scientific research in nanotechnology. So these films, there's about 15 of them, I, and I encourage you to visit the website and, and, and look at them. They're all, all created by different artists and put together, um, as well as, uh, as out artists um, responses to the uh, to this um, to the work and um, so they were used as outreach material for uh, the Royal Society summer science exhibition um, so just finally I, I'll just leave you on the uh, the the, oh, the last slide here which is it's got contact details of my website and um, also the nano vignettes but I wanted to say that we live in a world that's awash in science and technology, but also really rooted in culture and communities. And there's an increasing awareness um, of the benefits and enjoy really of interdisciplinary work and thinking. If we have, um, if we all if, can have a basic scientific and, and sort of cultural autistic literacy and understanding, we can be more active and participate productive participants in whatever our realm is. And I'm thrilled at these openings and the deepening of engagement between those who dedicate themselves to a scientific method of 
um, and those who take an artistic approach to investigation, because in the end, they're both two routes to similar ends, creativity and exploration. So thank you for this, and thank you for, um, and so I, I will let you, I'll let you go on to the next. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much, Melissa. That was really, really, really exciting to, to know more about your work and, you know, how you are interacting with scientists to produce such, you know, get to know about the art as well. So again, uh, if anyone in the audience would like to have uh, to ask Melissa any question, please use the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen and post it there. Uh, we will we will present it to Melissa and uh, Laurie in the Q&A session. So our next section of the evening is the most exciting one. Uh, at least that's that's my personal favorite. And where the students talk about the uh, PDBR project and their experience um, when they took on the project. So we have made a small uh, compilation of these video messages from the students and um, we will present it to you. So enjoy the film. interesting project to be able to combine my two interests in the different subjects and I think taking that on that biological twist actually allowed me to think about my art in a renewed way after that. In this project I really enjoyed making 3D models of protein structures and experimenting with different media. I especially enjoyed using knitting in the beginning and then using wire and fantasy film for the first time when I created my final piece. I love this project because it involves both science and art, which I both enjoy very much. I find it so amazing that something that's so small, like protein, I can make out of mod rock or something. It's just It's so amazing how we can visualise that, even yeah. though it's so tiny that you can't see it without an electron microscope. As someone who is already interested in molecular biology, was being able to connect two of my passions, science and art, in a way that I really hadn't before and create something that I was really proud of. I also enjoyed using different materials like newspaper and wire to make my final piece by like twisting and gluing them together and it was quite exciting to do it. For me this project was really interesting, also quite intimidating um, because I don't really do science anymore um, but I find it so interesting obviously and um, it explains everything around us and for me art does a similar kind of thing um, it gives a different perspective um, and I thought this was a really great project. I think something that surprised me was just how applicable and how interdisciplinary this subjects can be even though many people might think that sciences and art are distinctly separate. In this project I really enjoyed researching different protein structures and it was quite surprising to see how artistic they were in real life. Using the protein database I learned a lot about the 3D structure of helicase and other enzymes and things that actually help me in biology now. Learning how to use the database and finding proteins and how to understand their structures and the alpha um, helices and beta sheets and kind of how all of the structures fit together, which was very useful in my biology course and also just something I was interested in. This whole project has really helped me kind of develop my art. Um, I now do hyperrealism work for my A-level. The detail that I used in this project and kind of the um, specificness that I needed to create um, really did inspire me um, and 
that really helped me with the direction I wanted to go for my A-level. At Crack I learned a lot about common structures of proteins and viruses and such of helixes and it was very interesting to see how they were commonly represented visually. I learned how to use loads of different medias. I created a 3D project with the whole process including research and creating it itself. Through the course of this project I found that I learned quite a lot of just not just about proteins but about us as well. Visiting the Centre of Molecular Biology was a really great experience as someone who was interested in this kind of science. It was really fascinating to see the kind of work that they were doing at the centre and to see things like the electron microscopes. It was just, it was really, really fun. I really liked visiting the Centre for Molecular Biology because I liked seeing how real scientists work in real life. I found that really exciting. And I also liked the building and how close it is to where I live. It was really cool to see how scientists use different equipment to see those such tiny substances. And it was also really good to see the electron microscope for me because I've only heard about it in our science classes and I wanted to see it. I learned a lot at the Centre for Molecular Biology and it was really inspiring to see other students' artwork and how we can create artistic models of such tiny substances. My thoughts about art and science is that they're both great subjects but also something that I definitely learnt with this project was that they're great together and I, I think it was something that really opened up um, an option that I hadn't seen before and since I'm interested in both I thought it was really cool to be able to kind of cross them over and they're so different in some, so many ways but then seeing that they can relate was really interesting because I just have never thought about them as similar. This project has really been amazing in every way really. I've never really thought of using science in my work um, but I now know that they do fit quite well together um, and that it is possible to kind of do anything with my art. Um, so that's really helpful for me and I'm really grateful for that. Subjects such as art and science which you could see as complete polar opposites can in fact be very linked and how things like art can help progress science and vis really visualise things that you couldn't before and how that can help you understand and then move forward with discovery. Okay, so it's fantastic there to hear from the students who have been part of the project. We're now going to go on with our question and answer session. I think we've had some questions already coming in, um, but you can continue to ask those questions through the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. Um, and I'd like to introduce, um, to bring Laurie and Melissa back again, so that we can, uh, we can start on some of these questions. So. The first question um, that's come in that I want to ask you is, I think both of you can potentially have a view on this one, um, but maybe I'll start with Laurie and um, we'll move on to Melissa afterwards. So the question is, um, the collaboration of art and science is very valuable. What other new collaborations are needed to elevate science? Uh, collaborations outside of art. Um, I, I mean, well, you know, I think one of the, um, I talked a lot about biology, but one of the things, where, one of the areas where we can make more progress, I think, is collaborating in other areas of science, for example, or engineering. And so bringing together not just biologists, but also physicists, chemists, engineers, materials scientists um, is super important. And so, you know, that's, that's really about advancing the science. I think... Um, we talked a lot about the visual arts, but I think other types of arts can also help in the same way um, in helping to think about and visualize science and to communicate it to the bigger, uh, bigger public. 
Great, thank you. And uh, yeah, so Melissa, the, the same question, you know, what other collaborations potentially could we use to, to elevate science in the way that we seem to be doing nicely with art? Mm. Um, I, I think that as Laurie said, that um, when we speak about art, if I say art, a lot of times people think visual arts, but there's such a broad spectrum um, by what people mean by arts. Um, and one thing that came to mind is there's a recent call out for um, artists in residence at CERN, uh, so the um, uh, the big collider in, in um, CERN. And, and, and so I know that there have been dancers that work there, poets, uh, there, the rap artists, there's all sorts of different um, types of uh, ways that people can be expressive. And I think even just, you know, writing or, or working in communities. And, and I think that really it's just more this, this, it is important to specialize because we can't, you know, if we're too broad, we can't really, we have to by default be more superficial, but, but to have a context for which we can have this interaction um, is uh, just very fruitful as well. So just balancing those. Great, thank you very much. Um, okay, so um, another question here for Melissa. Um, the question is, how do you compile all of the history and research that goes into your projects and into your pieces? <laughs> very messily. Um, so, um, <laughs> so uh, um, yeah, that's it, it's it's interesting for me because it's so it's so natural for me. Just to, I, I think sometimes artists can be like like crows or something you just kind of pick up and, and and pieces from everywhere and 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 also also you're just sort of a, a, a medium like you, you just you hear things or you express things that are going on so um even the the act of making something is a way of listening and and finding out so a lot of the times i i um i find out through making through I, I, and I articulate myself through uh, through the project, so so I guess it's it's kind of built into how how I'm thinking, um, and I hope that maybe well, anyhow. So one person did say of, of my work one time, you know, it's amazing you kind of make such. And she said this in the nicest way, such a mess, but such beautiful things come of it. The thinking can be really really messy, and I would imagine that's true of any sort of discipline that sometimes. It's very wide, but then you just pick out the bits and pick them up, polish them up, and they're there. That's what I meant to say. Thank you very much. Um, okay, so this is a question uh, I think you could both perhaps contribute to. And um, so this is from one of the teachers from one of the schools. Um, one question they get asked when their schools are inspected, particularly in the current climate, um, no one ever would question the value of science. Um, but do you think that art should be valued in the school curriculum? And then why dedicate time and money to teaching art and your views on, on that side of things? Yes. <laughs> um, there's been a big move from, uh, you know, for the STEM subject, science, engineering, um, science, math, engineering, what the technology. And, uh, but there's also this movement that it's kind of originated from the States, but it's from STEM to STEAM. It's bringing art into that too. And I, and as I tried to say through my talk, uh, you know, we're really only using half of our full intelligence. If we're just cleaving ourselves and thinking we're just going to, you know, use one, one way of looking. And we heard that from the students as well, that, you know, just, they, 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 start off a lot of times with a natural enthusiasm for many ways of investigating and many, many interests. And it's kind of uh, that we, we almost kind of have to attrition our uh, abilities um, because of the culture that we live in. And I think that we can only benefit by, by, by keeping things wider. Um, and, and, and we could, and we will need to use all those false skills as we move into a more uncertain and um, world and challenges. So, um, I don't know what your your thinking on this is, Laurie. Yes, Laurie. Um... So I think you know. I think Melissa, you you mentioned when you gave your talk that the process of of doing an art project and doing science is often quite similar, right? And you you go down a similar path. And I think the idea is that 
I mean, you need creativity and imagination, I think, a lot of times. Sometimes science is, you know, just doing the same thing over and over again. But lots of times the breakthroughs come when you, you're creative and you think of new ideas. So I think kind of in any way being creative helps to stimulate, um, you know, both art and science. Actually, one thing I would say is that it's, uh, you know, that you might have different methodologies that you're using. So you might have, a, a, you know, even the the scientific method or the, um, the, the the process that you would use and the artistic, and they're like a tool toolkit. And if you have a, a bigger toolkit, you just are able to do, you know, a, approach more problems. So that's that's another way to think about it. Great, thank you very much, uh, both of you. Uh, so a question here more for Laurie. Um, is simply what are your favorite proteins and why? Oh my gosh, my favorite proteins. Um, well, I guess the ones that I showed you are some favorite ones because we just determined their structures. And I think it's always extremely exciting to figure out how something works. And, you know, there was a mystery in the field for a long time of how do these things recognize DNA and what goes on and, and to actually see that they, they actually wrap right around it was pretty amazing. So, I guess that's my most recent favorite favorite protein. Great, thank you. Uh, and one for Melissa. Um, how can arts be incorporated to help with mental mental health in graduate school? It's a very stressful time for many graduate students. Um. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, because well, let's see. Specifically, I might I recommend you know just getting a notebook and just using this blank space, and you might draw or write in it. So that's a really practical, and I don't know how you know practical you want me to be, but just it's just creating a, a, a protective blank space where any you know, but a safe space that any any anything can happen. Um, so I did work uh, for several years with a, an art therapist, and we worked in. Uh, women's shelters and in homeless shelters um, and, and just really just using um, the bringing whatever it is that you have onto the page or into your space and just just allowing things to happen can be can be quite helpful and then people do this naturally through they might be using music or, uh, and it and it's not just related to like physical expression it might be like movement that you, you're going out and so um so i think that play is maybe a, a, and just allowing space for play is a, is a good place to to start um yeah great thank and you and the universities have lots of clubs and societies to you know that that you can join in and uh, for example i i did a life drawing uh, club when i was a graduate student and it's it's a great way to you know, get out of the lab and do something, something different as a graduate student. And these things are, especially now, there are a lot of online forms like this where you can actually be interactive and you can be as present or as not present. So you can always mute, you know, just kind of watch other people too, if you want to be a little bit, but you know, it is important to get connected. Excellent. Thank you both very much. Um, one final question is, is more about the art project itself. So I might answer that one. Um, so it's about um, how project, how the project can scale to more schools. And I think um, one of the ways that we've seen this happen in this year's project is through our collaborator, Anisha Patel, who has been able to pick up kind of the, the bare bones of the project and how we interact with, science, uh, with the student artists and do the same thing in, in Melbourne, in Australia. Um, also, one of the things is through our visits to some of the other scientific institutes. So by being able to go to and have the exhibition at the MRC Laboratory of Molecular Biology, that broadened it to more people, also more scientists. And I think engaging those scientists and, and getting them involved in, in helping bring the project to more people would be fantastic. Um, so... It's reached six o'clock there, so I'm going to have to close the, the Q&A now. Um, there are various other ways, as I'll say shortly, for you to get in contact with us. Um, and I'd like to thank again, Laurie and Melissa, for coming and, and giving us your, your perspectives and answering the questions for us. Thank you.
Thank okay, you. so um, we have some other thank yous to do before we leave. Um, so as I've mentioned, big thanks to Laurie and Melissa for joining us and, um, and for giving us their perspectives and some of their views from both the scientific and artistic perspective. Um, and in terms of organization of this event, um, big thanks go to our Welcome Genome Campus public engagement team who have helped us with a lot of the logistics involved and helping to guide us through because this is our first time doing this virtually and it's a very much a new experience for us. And also our MBLEBI comms team for helping us to promote it, um, but especially um, Bryony, who's our public engagement officer, who's helped us put together and been involved massively in this. Um, we're, of course, grateful for the funding we've had to support the project that's been able to bring the students to the campus and provide materials for them to work with. Um, so this is from Emberley BI, uh, also the campus, Welcome Genome Campus Connecting Science through their enabling fund and also through our Welcome Trust grant. Of course, we'd like to thank the schools and teachers who've been involved and uh, the, all these schools here have been involved and the teachers have been fantastic at really getting stuck into this, especially those coming from an arti artistic background and yet really tackling this science art problem. Um, but most importantly, we want to thank the, the students themselves without whom we won't, wouldn't have these artworks and wouldn't be able to present this, this exhibition to you. So um, in the next slide, we have some information about um, how you can go and find more information about things related to the opening event. So firstly, um, Melissa shared some of these links. They're here again if you want to find out more about her work and um, the nano vignettes project, uh, those links are there. If you want to get in contact with us or find out more about the PDB art project, then you can visit our website at pdbe.org slash art. And you can also join our mailing list at pdbart at ebi.ac.uk. And we'll occasionally mail out information about the project and when we're having events through that mailing list. Um, we're part of the Welcome Genome campus um, ourselves, so there's a lot more goes on with public engagement through the campus. So again, you can find out the information through their website. And we also have um, our own social media accounts as well that provide information both from a scientific perspective, some of the new features that we're offering, some of the new science that's coming through in protein structures. Um, there's also a link to our, our, our YouTube channel there as well, where we will make this recording and other recordings related to the art project available after today's session. And then the final thing I'd just like to say on the last slide is please go away and visit the virtual exhibition. There's a short link there to get you straight to it, or you can find it from our PDB art website as well and share it with friends, with colleagues. We'd love this to be celebrated as widely as possible. And um, the fact that this is a virtual exhibition means we really hope it can be shared around the world. Um, there will be a post-event survey that will open automatically after you've finished the event. So we'd we'll be grateful if you could fill that in, give us some of your thoughts about how you found the event and the project. And also uh, there's a hashtag we have for social media for Twitter. Um, so hashtag PDB art. And if you have any thoughts or um, things you want to share about the project or the exhibition, please add the, that hashtag in there. And we can keep an eye on those and, and promote those as well and really celebrate the, the art project through that. So I think that brings us now to the end of the opening event. So I'd like to finally just thank everyone involved and thank you for attending and asking questions. And we hope to see you soon at the next one. It might even be face-to-face -face then, but we'll see, see how things go. But again, thank you so much for attending.